Good morning. So good to gather with you virtually. It's been a while since I've sat behind my computer and I've been able to hear the visiting that happens before our time on Sunday morning. Of course, it's great to be at the building and be able to see people face to face, but I'm thankful for this technology that allows us to gather when the circumstances require it. So good to be here. I don't know how many of you have had an opportunity to visit Old Faithful. The guys are in Yellowstone National Park. I have never had the privilege of going there, but uh, I've been reading about it. And on the Park Service website, it describes Old Faithful uh, as uh, today it erupts around 20 times a day. And the typical length of time that it erupts is somewhere between one and a half and four and a half minutes at a time. And during those eruptions, it will erupt anywhere between 3,700 gallons and 800, or sorry, 8,400 gallons uh, for that longer duration of 4.5 minutes. According to <laughs> the, uh, the website, the eruptions are predicted with a 90% confidence rate within a 10 minute variation. And they base these estimates on the height of the previous eruptions and uh, the height and duration of the previous eruptions. I wonder what it would be like to be the person who is responsible for keeping all of the statistical data about Old Faithful. Uh, the website says during visitor center hours, geyser statistics and predictions are maintained by the naturalist staff. It's done by good old fashioned observation, timing with the stopwatch and writing in a logbook. And you can check their website for posted prediction times in most buildings in the Old Faithful area and on the webcam page. If you're visiting a park and you want to see a beautiful natural phenomenon that has been erupting for I don't know how many years, then plus or minus 10% I think would be okay. If you can be, if you can predict within 10 minutes, whether something will erupt, well, that will give you enough leeway if you wish to visit Old Faithful. But for some things, plus or minus 10% is not quite good enough odds. If I had to have surgery, I would much rather have as close to 100% odds of a, of a successful outcome as possible. And if it came to my eternal destiny, I would want to build my hopes on things that were absolutely certain that could stand the test no matter what happened. There are certain songs we sing that help root us in that one who is steadfast and eternal and faithful. 
hold to his hand, to God's unchanging hand. Hold to his hand, to God's unchanging hand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold to God's unchanging hand. We sing, great is thy faithfulness. O God, our Father, there is no shadow or changing with thee. Thou changest not, thy compassions they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness. Songwriters have reflected on God's eternity. I think one term that is used of God's unchanging nature is his immutability. There are no mutations with God. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And yet he is infinitely wise and infinitely glorious. A song that's in our songbook, number seven. I don't know if I sung it at our congregation. Or we don't do it quite frequently, but listen to the reflections from this song. Immortal, invisible, God only wise, in light inaccessible, hid from our eyes, most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days, almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. Unresting, unhasting, and silent as night, nor wanting, nor wasting, thou rulest in might. Thy justice, like mountains, high soaring above, thy clouds, which are fountains of goodness and love. Now listen to this next verse. To all life thou givest, to both great and small. In all life thou livest, the true life of all. We blossom and flourish as leaves on the tree and wither and perish, but not changeth thee. Our lives on this earth are for but a moment. We are like mists that come and go. But God stands eternal. And he has created us in his image for life. He has created us to live with him. But ever since the fall in the Garden of Eden, we've had to contend with death and separation from God. The writers of the Psalms were operating in a period of time that was before the cross, before the incarnation of Christ. And yet they appreciated the eternity of God. They didn't have the message of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, the Son of God, the Word of God made incarnate. 
they didn't have the New Testament. They were operating with what they had. The, the old covenant based on the law and the prophets and the writings to the faithfulness of God, looking to him for wisdom and guidance. In the Psalms, we see the Psalm writers reflecting on the blessing that God has given us in his word. Of course, there are many different ways that the Psalm writers describe the nature of God's word. In Psalm 19, starting with verse seven, The psalm writer says, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant ward, warned in keeping them, there is great reward. God's word is referred to by a number of terms. We can identify eight of them. Listen to the various titles that are given to God's word. The law of the Lord. The testimonies of the Lord. The ways of the Lord. The precepts of the Lord. The statutes of the Lord. The commandments of the Lord, the judgments of the Lord. And then, of course, there's the word of the Lord. It's not just simply a law book that we study, but it's the very word of God, the judgment, the wisdom, the testimonies, the way of the Lord. It is in meditation on this word that we are rooted in things eternal. Back in Psalm 19, what pardon, Psalm 119. If you wish to open up your Bibles, we are going to be dwelling for this period of time in the text starting with verse 89, Psalm 119, verse 89 and following. Please read along with me in this text. Psalm 89. Your word, Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Your faithfulness continues through all generations. You established the earth, and it endures. Your laws endure to this day. For all things serve you. From this section, we learn, number one, 
that God's word is eternal. God's word is eternal. Everything is changing around us. We can't know for sure what is going to happen. We can't know for sure if something that we were sure about, that we were relying on, will be there or will not be there tomorrow. You may be saying to yourself something like, I don't recognize the world we are living in. I don't understand where things are going. We form frames of reference about how life ought to operate. And just as we think we have figured some things out, we understand that things change. And what we were relying on is not as stable as we once thought. We may be in great health one day, and the next day we are not healthy. The strength we had relied on, it changes. We have to press on and move on. We think about what the world was like as we were growing up. We might think of the good old days. And there may be a part of our life that could go back to days that were more predictable. But God has not allowed us to go back, and God has not allowed us to predict the future either. Indeed, he is the eternal one. He knows the future. For him, a day is like a thousand years. The thousand years is like a day. He stands outside of the frame of time. Thus, we are dependent on him. And this is what the Psalm writers reflect on. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord abides forever. So God's word is eternal. But second of all, God's word gives life. Look at verse, one moment. Look at verse 92. If your law had not been my delight, I would have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have preserved my life. Save me, for I am yours. I have sought out your precepts. The psalm writer has rooted his life in the life of God, as proclaimed in his word. The psalm writer finds something life-giving about the scriptures. There is something about God's word that gives us a sense of rootedness, 
security, and hope. We know that hope deferred makes a heart sick, but a desire fulfilled is a tree of life. As we dwell on the hopeful, clean, bright, wise word of God, it's good for us. A joyful heart is good medicine. And those who are rooted in the scriptures and dwell in it day and night, meditating on the good news and the grace and mercy of God, they are the ones who are like a tree that is planted by streams of water, whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like the chaff which the wind drives away. The word gives life. The word describes the best kind of life that we could live. It is a life with God. And that is what we are created for. So much of our health is dependent on the quality of our relationships. A baby who is not embraced, who is not held, doesn't form bonding connections with his mother, may cease to thrive and may die. We need a sense of connection, a sense of bonding with others. And the greatest command is to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love our neighbor as ourself. God has called us to life, eternal life. And we learn about that life and how it is to be lived through his word. So God's word gives life. But then th number three, God's word is boundless. In verse 95 of Psalm 119, the psalm writer says, The wicked are waiting to destroy me, but I will ponder your statutes. To all perfection I see a limit, but your commands are boundless. Michael Frost and Graham Joseph Hill described it this way. We have a big, beautiful, expansive gospel. In the scriptures, we learn that God is multifaceted. You can't nail him down. Christ is glorious. And we could spend eternity meditating on his beauty and greatness. We serve a good and beautiful God. A wise God who is able to launch the heavens and the earth into their respected places, who's able to create the beauty of the lily of the field. 
and to knit us in his image. If we are skilled in any way in mathematics or scientific pursuit, imagine the wisdom and knowledge of God who could measure the depths of the sea as, as in a thimble and who knows not only the number of the stars in the universe, but the hair on every head. And whenever a sparrow falls, God knows that. He created and sustains this glorious world we are living in. And as we read his word, we, we learn that God is far higher, wider, deeper, broad than we might appreciate. And the more we dwell in this glorious book that we have given, the more we are able to stand in awe of our glorious God. And the more we are able to fall in love with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory forever. The evil one wishes to enslave and destroy so that we have no options. The evil one wants us to be trapped and limited. God leads us in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. In the kingdom of God, his economics are geared towards healthy growth. His is a kingdom based on love and justice and right. When we look at what is the end of God's plans, it is only glory, light, and life. And the more we meditate on the scriptures, the more we are connected with this expansive, glorious, boundless gospel. Do you want to become rich? Even without a compounding financial investment? The way to become rich is to meditate on God's word, to let it dwell deep in your heart, soul, mind, and strength. God's word is boundless. So while Old Faithful may be a beautiful thing to visit, and I hope someday to visit Old Faithful, and I'll, I'll leave some, um, some extra time in case it's off by plus or minus 10 minutes. But will you join me in building your hope on things eternal by holding to God's unchanging hand as he speaks to us in his word? May his word be our meditation. May we not only be hearers of his word, but doers of his word, and therefore discover for ourselves that God's word is eternal, that God's word gives life, and that God's word is boundless. Would you pray with me, please? Thank you, Father, that we can hold to your hand, that you have reached out to us and you have held us in your hand, even when we do not have the strength to carry on. 
you've taken us from the pit and from the miry clay and you set our feet on the rock even as your son said that those who hear and do what he says are like those who build their house on the rock please father help us to delight and trust in your eternal word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. Well, this really is a super Sunday. 